Hey everyone, <clears throat> what's up? Goldie here. And I'm going to be going over the nine game main slate that we have here on uh, Wednesday. It's a day slate. So DK, uh, well I guess they made, they made this the main slate instead of the four game, uh, I guess, night slate that starts at the typical main slate start time. Um, and we got kind of an early start here, 12.30 Eastern for a couple of these games um, in uh, New York and Pittsburgh. And then we kind of trickle down uh, throughout the afternoon. So uh, with an early start, let's uh, let's just get into it. Uh, we've got projections and ownership up and loaded to the site already. Uh, so keep an eye on how things change. Um being a day game, you will see some shenanigans in lineups. So if you're building a bunch of teams here today uh, with an early lock, unfortunately, the most popular team on the day is going to be the Yankees, who you probably want to have exposure to. Um, their lineup won't be a problem. We'll have that. It's building around them that you'll have to uh, have to adjust to as some of the, the other lineups will come out... Um, almost certainly after these couple of games start. So just something to, to keep in mind. Um, heavy ownership coming in here to uh, a couple of guys, Kershaw and Castillo, in the early going. Less so on Kevin Gosman, Zach Wheeler in the Philly-Toronto game. Um, and kind of spread out in the mid-range a little bit more today than we have been in the past several days. Down here at the bottom, really st still seeing a lot of red numbers. Maybe a couple of pieces projection-wise that are, are popping here a bit so far, uh, and maybe one or two that, that we could just fully ignore and, and not even worry about. So uh, that said, let's just get into the games real quick and see if we can't uh, go through this pretty quickly and and get after it. Okay, Oakland and New York, one of the early games. Kyle Muller on the mound. He's one of the pieces that I don't think we're going to be able to go after. Now, you'd get a lot of leverage playing Kyle Muller today. He's 5,100, and he will make a lot of stuff work for you. But that doesn't mean – like, he's, he's really only got one good pitch here. Um this usage is basically static, but none of the fastball is providing any value. The slider has been pretty equitable so far this season, um, but that's really the only pitch he's got. He's pitching to too much contact, full 80% here. He's got some walk problems, and it's a day game, Yankee Stadium, and the Yankees get judged back, right? So um, Glaber's got bombs in the last couple of days. Uh, Volpe... Saw the baseball a little bit better yesterday. DJ, still at a playable price tag in the middle of the lineup. So there's some guys here for the Yankees that are going to make stacks very playable in order to get up to Judge and Glaber. Um, Harrison Bader being one of them. His price coming up a little bit, but still a playable 3800 You can play some of the guys down at the bottom of the lineup. I'd prefer to stay off of IKF, but he's 2100 um, and he's got a bat, you know, so kind of, uh, <laughs> and he, he's in the outfield now, so you don't have to like eat a shortstop or, or something like that. You can get a little funky with something like that. And he's one of the guys that'll come in a little bit less popular. So if you want to get to the Yankees, you're going to have to figure out how to get a little bit different with them. Um, but there's plenty of other games that you can get to, to make that happen. And you might need to take advantage of some late swap stuff. So despite the attractive price tag here for Kyle Muller, the fastball stuff isn't very good. It's only the sliders. That would take me off of Anthony Rizzo a little bit, but they're going to platoon pretty heavily here. I think that will the Yankees uh, against Muller. And Oakland's bullpen is terrible. So if you want to throw Rizzo into stacks, that's fine because bad fastball and a bad change is bad fastball and a bad change mix. That just because he's got one good slider uh, or one good out pitch against same-handed hitters doesn't really um, mean that we should totally come off you know, one of the better hitters in the Yankee lineup. So uh, he's a little bit expensive at 48 uh, in general, but that's perfectly playable for sure. So you can, uh, if you're fully stacking the Yankees, 
you're going to want to uh, include some Rizzo because Oakland's bullpen is bad. And if they run Kyle Muller early, um, you're absolutely going to be pretty terrified every time Anthony Rizzo gets uh, gets in a bat against like a um, Chicharo Fujinami or something coming out of the bullpen uh, who has been dreadful this year. So I would definitely get to the Yankees if you're building a lot of teams. Single entry, they're probably... Um, they're probably your best bet as well, but they're going to be very heavily owned. Some of these guys will pop today for, uh, you know, pushing 30%, I would guess. So, um, I haven't looked at individual ownerships, but in team aggregates so far, they are, they're coming in as certainly the most popular. So Johnny Brito on the mound for them, 5,700. It's an attractive price tag for sure, because he's got a, he's a right-hander, uh, against Oakland, um, and we saw even yesterday with Clark Schmidt, guy that's got severe split deficit to left-handers, like, it, it's still possible for a righty with a workable arsenal to pick through Oakland over here. Um, they're just not all that powerful, right? So far this season, 95 WRC+, plus, 148 ISO, just average here in, in pretty much every category, a lot of soft contact and popping a good bit of balls up, full 12% infield fly ball rate, 26% K rate. So, um, you know, despite the uh, the Jordan Diaz, you know, Sammy Sosa type of game yesterday, um, we can't really uh, expect that to continue. Do you want to go after some Johnny Brito and play some A's pieces? Sure. He's really giving it up to the right side because all of the value pitches – against the right side so far this season have been dreadful. Uh, that's the four-seamer, that's the sinker, and the slider. Um, and all of them have been really, really bad. The only semi-serviceable pitch has been the sinker, but it's break-even and, and showing negative value here as well. Uh, the changeup has been good, so he can neutralize a couple of these lefties over here, but I still think a, a J.J. Blade hitting in the four-hole 2,600 at Yankee Stadium in a day game is a very playable piece if you'd like to get there, as is Ryan Noda at 2,800. Not my favorite because this is the equitable pitch for Burrito, um, but you can play some of these righties because the fastball mix and the slider just has not been there. And here in the early going, we can see very short sample, of course, just 26 and two-thirds on him and 13 and two-thirds to the righties, but he's getting real really picked apart by the right-handers. Maybe a little noisy because of that one start against Minnesota where he got bludgeoned. But 302 average, 420 Woba, and a 340 ISO with a 15% K rate against the right side with 40% hard contact. Like You can't really fake these numbers. And he's walking some guys too. High walk rate against lefties, power against righties. That actually makes for a really intriguing stack because that's a very high barrel rate. In 85 batted ball events, 15% is 15%. So uh, you can go after Burrito here. I'd prefer, despite the attractive price tags for the pitchers on the mound, to stay off of that. Um, you know, it's 70 degrees Yankee Stadium. It is good day for baseball. Ball should fly. So um, you can play some Oakland here on the other side if you're building a lot of teams. They probably wouldn't make it for me in, like, single or 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 three max or something like that, but you could play them in 20 max. You play a Steri Ruiz, you play Brent Rooker. And if you want to chase a, a three homer day on Jordan Diaz, eh, not my favorite, but he's 2,400 still. Um, and you can play Shea behind the plate if he's, if he's in there today. So you can play some short stacks. Um, a lot of the Yankees for sure. And probably just no pitching on the mound for me. Okay, Colorado and Pittsburgh, the other early game here. Senzatella came back from his ACL, and he was serviceable, right? Went five innings, struck out just three, and didn't give it. He gave up, a, what, one run in his last start. And that's kind of a, a typical Senzatella, Senzatella outing. Um, and that's exactly what you're looking for if, if you are Colorado. Um, kind of frustrating to stack against sometimes. He still has gas. He throws hard. He can touch 97, 98, and that makes him a little difficult to deal with sometimes. He gets a lot of ground balls, very high ground ball rate at 2-1. to one. Um, So when he's got the ground ball stuff working, staying down in the strike zone, and the velocity, those those two things can, can work 
uh, really in his favor, and it makes him kind of difficult to stack against. Uh, Pittsburgh's offense has been very cold over the last couple of weeks, uh, or week or so. They've gotten torn apart by some good teams over in the AL East, uh, Toronto and uh, and Tampa. And they got they gave up a 10 spot to the Rock, these same Rockies yesterday. So um, they've been cold a little bit and scuffling. A lot of their 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 top end guys are very expensive still. Brian Reynolds is at fifty nine hundred still. Uh, Brian Hayes forty six hundred. He's a high ground ball hitter. We're not going to want to deal with him in a negative platoon split uh, against a very high ground ball pitcher today. Somebody I would probably end up staying off. You could play Reynolds, of course, but he's fifty nine. Um, he's a good pivot off of somebody like a Judge, but uh, difficult spot. He'll be able to get the ball in the air if you want to go after some Sensatella. I'm not super thrilled about doing that in general uh he doesn't walk anybody despite the fact that he pitches to so much contact he's got to be really really bad and floating a lot of the four seamer and the slider up here and just giving up baseballs in the air which he doesn't do all that often uh for full stacks to get there against senza so um kind of frustrating not that i want to play him of course he's only got a 13 percent k rate and a seven percent swinging strike rate so uh no thank you in that regard but um, that kind of takes me off of Pittsburgh a little bit. You might give up three runs. Surprisingly, the Colorado bullpen has been pretty damn good this year. Uh, they've got a couple of guys healthy uh, on the back end that have performed very well so far. And this game is in Pittsburgh, despite it being in a day game that will play up power a little bit. It's still a pitcher's ballpark. So um, Kind of off of Pittsburgh here a little bit. Some other teams I think I'd rather get to, but they're definitely an off-the-board stack. If you're if you're looking for a bounce for their offense, um, there are a couple of guys here, like a Jack Sawinski, 3,900. He's very playable. Josh Palacios, he's the stone min. You can play him. Jiwon Bay has got plenty of speed upside. He'll be down at the bottom of the lineup, probably a little pricey for him, but uh, you can get to a couple of lefties here if you'd like. Senza often actually gives up a little bit more power and production to the right side. But, like, both of these, like, both righties and lefties are going to hit for some average. 332 to the lefties, 353 to the righties over the last season plus. Um, he's not going to, he won't have made any changes in the arsenal here, so what we're looking at is, is what we're going to get. Um, so you could play some, some Pittsburgh for sure as kind of an off-the-board stack here in early runs. Uh, they're coming in about middling, in in value and middling in ownership so nobody's gonna be playing them because uh, they're kind of expensive it's not the greatest spot rich hill on the mound for them 7300 if you land on this i think this is probably fine he took them apart really really well at coors field earlier this season went six or a full seven innings i think at coors um yeah six innings struck out seven and he was fantastic and he had three starts in a row that were very good. The price tag, however, has come up from the low 6,000s where he was earlier. And now we're getting him at 20% ownership. Uh, this is the Rockies, and they're not great, certainly away from home. But the, their offense has really been rolling here. Um, they won a series against the Mets. They swept the Brewers at home. And I believe they've won two of three here so far uh, against Pittsburgh already. So... Um, this offense, a lot of these guys over here, Ryan McMahon in particular, is really heating up, kind of breaking out of his slump. CJ Crone is down to 4,300 now. You can finally play that price. A um, couple of these guys down at the bottom of the lineup. Alan Treo has been very serviceable. Zeke Tovar is really coming into his own as a, as a young hitter, playing every single day for them and playing really good defense. So they're not taking him out of the lineup, definitely. Brenton Doyle, who they recently called up. Uh, has also been, he's added some speed to the lineup, a little bit of pop as well. Jerry Profar hit two bombs yesterday. He's got three in his last uh, week or so. Mentioned before that he's a very streaky hitter. If he gets going, uh, look out. Because when he's seeing the baseball, uh, he'll, he'll, he'll do this. He'll hit a couple of bombs, and he'll just put up score after score after score for a couple of weeks. And I think we might be approaching that range he's 3500 leading off um really the only couple of cold guys in the lineup right now i guess our cj crone still a little bit and charlie blackman but uh 
Randall Gritchick, he's been fine, and th this is a very playable stack here um, at very attainable price tag. So if you want to get to some some really expensive guys on the mound and take some shorts on 20% on ownership of Rich Hill, then uh, I think this is reasonable to go after. Nobody's going to be playing the Rockies because no, nobody ever plays the Rockies, but they're they're popping a little bit harder, actually harder than Pittsburgh in early value scores. So uh, keep an eye out for projection updates, but you can get a little bit of leverage here on Rich Hill. We know Rich Hill, and he's usually only going to go about five innings or so. He's st been stretching out a little bit more this season, but this is the second time that Colorado's going to see him, and they'll have a little bit more of a book. Uh, on how they want to approach it. So I think uh, Colorado's a, a reasonable stack to get pretty off the board with. If you're playing a chonky Yankees, um, you could throw in some Rockies here and and get very, very different. I think there's upside going after Rich Hill with some of these righties here. CJ Crone at 4300 in particular, very attractive price tag. Uh, you get, But that said, you can play some Rich Hill if you land on him at 7300 There's really nobody else in that range that you're super enthused with, which is why the field is kind of pumping his ownership to about 20% right now. So it's fine if you land on that. Um, Colorado's still going to strike out, of course. But uh, I think I'd probably rather side with the Rockies there. Let's move on. Detroit and Cleveland. Uh, Eddie Rodriguez, he's been incredible over his last four starts, going really deep into games. Um, however, the price tag has come up. He's now 9100 I wasn't super thrilled about going after him at 7,800 against the Mets in his last outing, but he made me look like an idiot, and he went eight innings, struck out nine, gave up two hits in that in that game. So, um, walked one. I believe he actually came out for the ninth inning, uh, and then they yanked him or something. But it, it, in any case, he's been fantastic. He has, however, seen his price tag rise to 91 from 63, where he started this uh this little run here uh, against Cleveland, as a matter of fact, where he went eight innings, struck out 10. Seeing them for the second time here, uh, I, I still kind of have to side with Cleveland, even though Eddie's been fantastic. Um, really everything here in the pitch mix, fastball command has been excellent. And and the changeup's really been good for him as well. Uh, so far this season, throwing it still, I mean, not a lot has changed in, in terms of usage here still pretty static across the board um throwing the slider still about five percent of the time or whatever but getting value out of every every one of his pitches and the changeup really isn't as bad as this aggregate number shows it's it's still yielding a little bit of negative value but it's much closer to break even here than yielding a full two outs to the field so um He's been able to pick through a lot of lineups, both righties and lefties, not giving up any power in his last four starts. He's been very, very serviceable here, going very deep. Um, however, uh, I'm still probably not going to land on this, uh, nor will the field, and he's popping for a high projection here, and Cleveland is bad, man. This is a terrible offense. Even though they're not striking out, 21% is, you know, it's 21%. It's not you know, like something we want to go out of our way to to avoid necessarily, but a 76 WRC plus and a 121 ISO with a 281 Woba, no hard contact in it, and a buck 30 ground ball to fly ball rate. You know, we can go after this and we could attack this because this is just a really poor offense. Um, so if you want to land on some, or if you land on, on Eddie at 91, I'm not going to go out of my way to target this and, and, play Eddie uh, deliberately, but if you land on some in some deep tournament teams of very low ownership, he's been excellent, and you, you can't really ignore that. Um, this is really the the old Eddie that we're seeing here, throwing a lot of strikes and not walking anybody. He's been incredibly efficient, so um, will, is that likely to persist again today? I'd say probably not as readily, but um, it's it's fine. If you want to stack, Cle I mean, I'm not stacking Cleveland on a full on a full slate here. Uh, if you want to take some short pieces, I mean, sure, this is like way, way off the board. But Cleveland doesn't hit for any power uh, whatsoever. They are incredibly frustrating. So uh, it would be super hard to get there with Cleveland. And I don't want to necessarily go after Eddie. Um, I respect the changes that he's realized so far this season. I don't want to play him because he's, you know, a bit out of... Uh, upside price range for me, but I mean, he's put up nearly 40 point games 
in two of his last four outings. Um, so, you know, maybe he's not overpriced. Uh, it's He's been very, very good. Peyton Battenfield on the mound. He was excellent in his last start, too. Uh, for Cleveland, he got the Twins. He was perfect into the seventh inning. Um, I think it's kind of an outsized performance here a little bit. I, I think I would like to – well, I'm not going to chase it. Um, if you want to land on him at 6,100, this is a big projection so far against Detroit, who is bad, right? 79 WRC plus for them, 25% K rate, 118 ISO. It's lower than Cleveland. You know, all these numbers are actually worse than Cleveland. Um, hitting a few more fly balls, but like whatever, they will make more hard contact, which makes me a little bit concerned uh, with Battenfield in particular because because he's still. We talked about this in his last start. He's still giving up a crap load of hard contact here. Short sample is a short sample, but this is one of the numbers, hard contact, that converges, you know, the, the fastest, um, along with, like, first pitch strike, swinging strike rates, things like that. So high walk rate still, 11% is 11%. That will converge as well, and he's on the barrel here. That's a noisy number at 18%, so that'll come down. Um, and commensurately, the hard contact will come down. This was north of 60% to both sides before his last start. So it's come down in a hurry here, and it will. So we're going to see a lot of variance still in this short sample as these numbers flesh out. Um, at 6,100, I think this is a playable price tag against a bad team that's going to whiff and strike out. However, if you want to take a couple of lefty pieces that hit righties very well on the other side, like a Nick Maton or Riley Green, Zach McKinstry, he'll probably lead off. He's very playable. Second in outfield at 3,200. Uh, I think that's fine to get to some short stacks. 2,400 for Torque is is fine as well. He's got plenty of pop. Uh, full stacks of the Tigers are certainly not all that uh, intriguing on, on a full nine or ten games later, whatever we got here today, um, with some other teams. But you can use them as fillers as they are cheap, and they've got upside at their relative price tags. In particular, McKinstry, uh, Riley Green, 3,600, that's fine. Nick Maton as well from the left side. But like I said, if you want to play a Javi Baez, who is making a little bit more contact this year, 36, or Torque, I think those are okay uh, play, plays as well, targeting some regression in that near or whatever seven innings of a perfect game baseball that that Battenfield threw in his last outing so um some fine filler stacks from uh from Cleveland uh, probably or excuse me from Detroit probably no Cleveland outside of the typical guys like a Josie Ramirez he's still 5900 though I don't really want to go after uh Eddie you know pretty much at all um uh, that's kind of uh, that's kind of where we are. Just not uh, not super interesting here, um, but some playable pieces if you'd like to explore. Uh, Dodgers and the Brewers. Kershaw on the mound. I, I think I'd like to get to this 10-4 um, with Gosman, who we'll get to later. I think I'm going to land on a lot of Kershaw um, in this particular matchup. The Brewers are just dreadful against left-handed pitching this season. Shorter sample, 300 PAs, but a 64 WRC plus. When this regresses, it's going to regress. Uh, it won't be this low all season, but I mean, I've been saying this for the last like three or four starts <laughs> uh, against lefties, and the numbers really haven't changed. 31% strikeout rate, buck 65 ground ball to fly ball, and a 115 ISO. 30% hard contact is actually just kind of average. Um, so many ground balls here with a sub 20% line drive rate. I mean, right at 20%. This is not attractive at all. They're not walking, and They've had, they're really, really struggling against right or left-handed pitching this season. So Kershaw is in a fantastic spot here today. 10-4, this is a playable price tag. And we got plenty of value that we're going to be able to get to. We talked about a couple of cheap teams already. So 40% um, ownership, I'm, it, I am I hate playing pitchers when they when they get up into this 50-whatever percent ownership. Uh, but this is Kershaw. I'm, I'm okay eating this in this particular matchup today. Um, if you want to take some hedge pieces on the other side of the Brewers, Oof, I am not really sure I want to. Um, they might even have like a Willie Contreras behind the plate leading off. He's a catcher play, 4300 It's a playable price tag, but I don't want to go after Kershaw uh, with most of these guys. They strike out a, a just a crap load, and I'm not super interested. Um, 
in really anybody because the the price tags aren't all that attractive. Willie Adam is still 4,900. Not playing Yelich here at 49 either. Mikey Brasso at 36, he strikes out a 30% clip himself. Um, so not all that encouraging here. I'd just much rather get to Kershaw uh, and, and play him at 10-4. I'm I'm okay eating the ownership here because we can we can get different on the mound if we need to or uh, in the batter's box if we need to. Uh, Wade Miley on the mound for the Brewers, 6,800 for him. Um, kind of difficult to stack against is Wade Miley. Uh, he's just he's frustrating. Um, he survives a lot of the time, and he induces some soft contact, certainly to the opposite-handed hitters, pushing 20% now uh, against righties, and he'll give up a little bit of hard contact. But yeah, I mean, it's because he's only throwing 90 miles an hour. Um, you know, you could barrel up a baseball when it's only coming in at 90. You could do this, you know, th- these guys could do this in high school. They were seeing 90 miles an hour. So um, Wade Miley, obviously not a high school arm. He is much more serviceable. But that makes him hard to stack against because he's got 17 pitches here that he throws. Cutter very good still. Change pretty damn good. And that's what's inducing all the soft contact. Four-seamer, excellent, excellent value here in this aggregate sample over his last 72 innings, I mean, this is way, way above average for a guy that only throws 89-90. Um, three outs above above average. This is fantastic. That means it's location and it's sequencing, really attacking with just 20% of the usage on the four-seamer, but he gets a lot of value out of that because he mostly is a, is a cutter change guy. So that makes him difficult to stack against Dodgers. Also going to be pretty popular here today. Um, probably second to the Yankees. Um, I probably just prefer to get to the Yankees if I'm going to eat that kind of ownership. Uh, I don't like stacking against Wade Miley generally because he's just hard to get there against. Uh, a lot of the time he stays on the ground with this cutter change and induces soft contact. Um so he's very difficult to go after. However, this is the Dodgers. They have plenty of guys. Um, you can play Mookie, of course. 57, got a price bump. Will Smith had a good day yesterday. 4,900 for him. That's fine. Chris Taylor is dreadful. Uh, I, I long for the days when we don't have to worry about playing him uh, in the middle of a good lineup. Uh, he's just awful. But he's 3,000, and he has dual eligibility, so, so go ahead. Uh, he has pop, of course. Not my favorite play to be playing him today. Um, Miguel Vargas, he's been fantastic. Hit another ball out last night. He's 2,500 still. So he'd probably be my favorite price-adjusted play of the Dodgers from the right side. But once again, he's inducing Ismaili, a lot of soft contact to righties. Despite a very low strikeout rate and a high contact rate, uh, it's a lot of just kind of medium and, and soft contact uh, here from the right side. So not my favorite getting two full stacks of the Dodgers here. Uh, if you want to play Freddy, yeah, go ahead. Play him in stacks. Want to play Muncie? I mean, he's 5,300 today. I'm not super thrilled about that. Wade Miley has very rarely given up power to same-handed hitters, and even in this short sample over the last year plus, uh, it's a 015 ISO. 015. Um, one and a half percent extra base hits for guys from the left side of the plate is, uh, you know, not encouraging no matter how you slice it. Um, so not super jacked about going to play the Dodgers today. They're kind of in a miss spot and um i don't really want to go after miley i'd i'd like getting to a miguel vargas though at 2500 i think that's a fine play there's upside for him at that price even against miley it doesn't mean i want to play miley of course he's only got a 16 percent k rate at 6800 i'm still not interested there so um mostly just kershaw i think and not super thrilled about anything else okay uh, Texas and the Mariners, Dane Dunning on the mound. He is actually getting a lot of value. He's really changed up the pitch mix here. Um, he's moved, let's see, he's he's throwing 28% of the cutter now. So he's doubled that usage at the expense of the, let's see, what is it, the changeup that he's dropped the usage and a little bit of the slider. So he's basically taken um, – six percent seven percent of each of these pitches the changeup and the slider moved it over the cutter still throwing the sinker a lot 35 percent or so uh, but it's been valuable so far um the cutter is extreme plus value 25 and a third inning so far this season so nothing to you know get too excited about yet but 
really getting a lot of value out of the fastball mix, and that that's really kind of been a weakness for him in the past. He hasn't been able to establish as much as he'd need to, you know, with the sinker uh, in the cutter that he did throw at a far lower clip last season. Um, in order to allow him to get to a uh, you know, any of his, his secondary pitches, slider and the changeup. Now, his his changeup's actually been fantastic this year, and he's getting kind of a noisy uh, realized value out of it at, at about plus four outs above average. So um, the slider, however, is, has not been good, still hovering at, a, at this, you know, uh, minus one value or so, and really not throwing the curveball, maybe a couple of ticks up here at about 2%. So um, some changes, certainly, but much more of the cutter, and that's been the equitable pitch for him so far. Uh, the Seattle Mariners so far this season have been awful against righties. They've been average in pretty much every single category. Um, outside of the strikeout rate, which is well below average, pushing 26% here. Now they'll walk a little bit at 9%. Um, but everything else right is you know, pretty, uh, pretty average and not super exciting to be going after guys uh, that have made some plus changes in the arsenal. And the cutter against the cutter in particular, uh, Mariners have been horrible uh, this season, giving up a full out to the field um, against that pitch in particular. So they're attackable here with a good cutter. The slider, however, has been bad. So if he's floating this, that's how the Mariners can get to him in terms of the pitch mix. Um, and when I said a full out, I meant a full two outs that the Mariners are giving up to the field. So they've been dreadful against the cutter in particular. Um, so they're, they're very attackable here. If you land on a 5,800 Dane Dunning, that's probably all right as well. I'm not going to go out of my way to target this because I'm, I'm kind of worried about how deep he'll be able to go into a game, but I think he can induce some soft contact here. Um, you know, lot, not a lot of ownership going to come to the Mariners. They're just kind of middling in both ownership and value so far. It's okay if you want to get to them because they're very playable price tags. Julio down to 55. Uh, Ty France to 3,400 now. He's starting to heat up a little bit, um, hitting the ball a, a little bit harder over his last few games. Jared Kelnick still at 46, still playable. Gino at 39, I'm not super thrilled about because he kind of stinks, but uh, he's 39 in the four hole. It's kind of whatever. Cal Raleigh at 44, it's fine. Kind of expensive for a catcher piece, but uh, he hits very well from the right side, or excuse me, from the left side against righties. And Teoscar is at 37. So the top six here is all a, a very playable stack at, at these price tags. But I think Dane Dunning might be able to survive here a little bit given the changes in the pitch mix uh, and the extreme cutter value that he's realizing and the extreme negative value that the Mariners are seeing on that pitch in particular. Uh, they're going to see it 30% of the time here. So, um, you know, it's going to make it difficult for them to navigate a little bit. Uh, Luis Castillo on the mound, 10-1. Now, in his last one, we talked about his his pitch mix changes, moving more of the usage over to the good pitches in the four-seamer and the slider and throwing less of the bad. Uh, still not getting good value out of the changeup. Um, and in terms of realized production, he struggled a little bit in his last outing. He popped for, I think, I don't know, 14, 15 DK points or something. Kind of a difficult matchup against Houston. Yeah, he was but he still went seven innings, just didn't strike out anybody, and gave up four runs. So um, he was on the lower side of the strikeout variance. We kind of talked about Houston starting to to heat up a little bit and, and come back into their uh, lower strikeout ways over the last week or so, and that kind of materialized a little bit in, in Castillo's last start. So he's still 10-1 here um, and, and pulling th- – 50% ownership uh, against Texas. I really don't like going after this lineup, man, even though I've done it in the last couple of days with uh, both Kirby and Logan Gilbert, uh, who have been fantastic. Um, I don't necessarily expect that the Texas Rangers is just going to pick apart Luis Castillo here. Um, but yeah, I think the ownership is probably getting a little bit high. And because, given the other guys that we can still play, we could get to Gosman, get, you can get to Kershaw. You could even consider playing some uh, Zach Wheeler in that uh, Philly-Toronto game. So 
or some other guys in the in the mid range that you can also play as well. So I think we're probably getting a little carried away in the ownership here. However, Texas has been bad in these last couple of games and really not seeing the baseball, despite the aggregate figures being very encouraging. We talked about this hard contact rate against righties, split adjusted, still the highest number of any team on the day. 113 WRC plus. Everything is is fine here. A lot of power and some fly balls. Um so everything, everything's fine with the Rangers. They're just kind of going through a little bit of a cold streak. If you want to play some Castillo uh, in in tournament teams, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I probably come off of this in, in like a single entry or something. Um, there's some other guys I personally like more. But if you land on this, I don't think this is bad necessarily. But it's still a good lineup and still a little bit of vulnerability here for Castillo above this $10,000 price tag. We've always talked about this, and despite the changes, the plus changes in the arsenal and the usage, moving more to the, the good pitches and, and away from the bad, um, you know, you still got to pay over 10k for the guy, and you still got to eat 50% ownership on him on a full nine gamer. So, um, some things to consider. It's not that he's a bad arm. It's not the most plus spot. But, uh, you know, you can still attack Texas because they've been very cold. Um, offensively, I think in this game, we probably, if you want to take some heads pieces against Castillo, yeah, sure, you can play some uh, some Nate Low, 4,400. Price is dropping a, a little bit, um, you know, from the 47, 48 where he was. Whoever they throw in the two-hole, whether it's uh, Robbie Grossman or Jankowski or, you know, whoever, uh, they're cheap and... They're very playable. Both are, are going to hit from the left side. Probably be Grossman, I would say, but he's 2,400. If you want to get to a Marcus Simeon, he's a very good fastball hitter. I don't want to pay 5,900 for him. Um, so this would only be like deep tournament type of stacks where I where I landed on him. The same thing with Adelis Garcia, 5,500. These guys have plenty of upside to get through those prices, but with pretty low regularity, I would say, and we're still attacking a, a good arm. It's only a leverage play here uh, to get a lot of leverage on this field, on the field here at this 50% ownership. Um, but I do like some Nate Lowe a little bit, 4,400. He's a good hitter, man. And Robbie Grossman, I think, is a fine two-hole piece that you could mix in at 2,400, uh, hitting from both sides. And that's probably it. Maybe just some short stacks that I would get to from Texas if I want to get off of some of this Castillo ownership. I'll still have a, a good bit when building uh, a lot of tournament teams, um, for sure. And like I said, in 20 max or whatever, you'd probably still come in uh, pretty heavily in single entry in three. I think you can make some different decisions here. Um, Dane Dunning probably not being one of them. But uh, yeah, I think you could come off and get to like a Kershaw or, or one of the other expensive guys. Okay, Miami and Arizona. Eddie Cabrera. This is not one of the guys in the mid range I'm I'm attracted to here. <laughs> uh, I I hate the fastball mix, man. It's just still bad. Um, he's throwing the sinker a little bit more, but not getting any of any value out of any of the fastball stuff. Change. He's really lost a lot of value on um, so far this season as well. He's yielding about three about a quarter of an out to the field now so losing a ton of this this off-speed value that really allowed him to survive so now he's got a bad fastball mix and a bad changeup. um so he's got one good pitch because he's not throwing the slider nearly as much this season he's he's migrated a lot of this usage about 50 percent of it over to the curveball so um you know, he's throwing this full 27, 28% of the time now, and that's a little, like, like great. Like, the, he's moving more usage over to the pitches in which he's most confident and that have provided him the most value in the past in the changeup and the curveball, but yielding much less value, right? Only getting about half an out above the field here on the curveball now as opposed to one and a half uh, last season. So, um some concerning changes here in the arsenal and and realized value so far uh, in the pitches that allowed him to survive and induce soft contact and keep the baseball on the ground uh combine that with a bad fastball mix that's not a recipe i want to i, I want to be screwing around with at an elevated price tag 7800 so no thank you give me the d-backs they're hard to stack because they're expensive but that's going to keep their ownership down 
and they're popping um, really on the lower end of, of both ownership and value. So, um, you know, the, the projection's really not liking Arizona here so far, and it's mostly because of the pricing. Josh Rojas, 49, it's kind of a stiff price tag for him. He's fine if you want to play stacks. Cattell Marte at 56, also a little elevated, but also fine. Corbin Carroll, 58. That's really difficult to get to. Uh, Christian Walker, 47. Hard to get to. Some cheaper guys will make it easier. Paven Smith, I, I like this a lot at 3,200. Big fly ball hitter. And and Eddie, he's going to give up with negative change of value. He's going to give up a lot more power to the left side of the plate. Um, it's it's because, historically, that his change up and his curveball have been good that we're not seeing higher projection numbers in... Uh, for all of the D-backs here. And I, I, I think that's a, a little bit um, of a spot that we could probably attack because he's seeing much less positive value on these pitches here. It's going to make him vulner more vulnerable to lefties for sure, where he hasn't really given up all that much production. Um, the, the swing and miss isn't going to be there, and he's still going to have trouble throwing strikes. Cannot spot this fastball mix, and now he can't work to, to plus breaking pitches in the same relative value range as he has previously. So that's going to make it very difficult for Eddie to work through innings. A huge walk rate, 13.5%. No thanks. I'm, I'm not dealing with that. Um, but give me some give me some D-backs. You can play Dom Fletcher, 23. He'll make it cheaper. Or an Alec Thomas. He's at 25. Jerry Perdomo is cooled off. He's still 4,000. But they might do something funky over here with the lineup. So keep an eye out for that. Barrel Kelly on the mound for the D-backs. This is probably my favorite play of this game. Uh, I'd like to get to him again. We talked about it in his last start against Washington. Uh, I love playing this guy at... An approachable price tag in the mid-range and no ownership. And we've got that again today. And this is a bad team. Uh, despite Miami picking apart Brandon Fott last night, um, we can still go after them with right-handers. 80 WRC+, plus, no walk rate, under 7%, 24% K rate, buck 27 ISO. A lot of ground balls, buck 50 ground ball to fly ball. Hitting for a little bit of hard here, 32%, but like whatever, because it's mostly on the ground. So, yeah, we can go after Miami just as we could have yesterday. There's going to be much less variance with the Merrill Kelly. We know who Merrill is. Every one of his pitches is plus value here, and he's throwing five of them at real equitable splits. Very balanced in the arsenal. It makes him incredibly difficult to go after. Um, if you want to play Jazzy, yeah, sure. You want to play Solaire, I mean, sure. He's got, obviously, the most power on the team. Uh, Jesus Sanchez at 2,600 in the middle of the lineup. He's got a little bit of pop from the left side. Okay. Luis Arise, yeah, fine. He's going to make a lot of contact too. Um, so that's that's your Marlins stack, kind of a four-man. If you want to make it a full five-man, I don't know, throw in like uh, Yuli Gurriel who doesn't strike out. you got to play him at first base, but, though, no thank you. Uh, Joey Wendell, they got, just got him back. He's 2,700 shortstop. I mean, all right. But I don't like stacking against Merrill Kelly all of these pitches are good, and I would much rather get to him on the mound. This is the guy I want to play in this mid-range at 8,300. Uh, I love playing him at low ownership, and we saw in his last couple of starts, we played him at Coors Field. We talked about that as well, and and he popped there against the Rockies, as he kind of does a lot of the time. Um, he's very equitable, and he's very difficult to attack here. He, he's a really good arm, even though he doesn't have a hell of a lot of overwhelming whiff stuff. Uh, it's a good, good number two here in the rotation um, down here for the D-back. So I like getting to this spot a lot. Even coming off kind of an outsized strikeout performance game when he struck out 10 against the Nationals, I don't particularly care. He could do that again. Uh, I'm going to go right back to it. Uh, high median projection here. Uh, so I like this spot a lot. And you can correlate with some D-backs teams if you'd like and target some Eddie Cabrera. Okay, Washington, San Francisco, uh, 6,200 for JoJo Gray. Now, he's made the positive changes. We talked about this in his last start against the D-backs, actually, um, and that you might get a little bit of JoJo if you landed on him. He, I don't, I don't want to say he struggled. He still survived for about six innings. The K stuff wasn't quite there for him. But he has, he's been serviceable pretty much all season, uh, there's still going to be some variance with him because he's still figuring out the arsenal change here, but he's moved most of this over to the cutter. And 
the cutter's been pretty damn good for him. Uh, looking for him over on the sheet over here. Um, obviously, last last year the four seamer usage was totally dreadful, and it it got him into a lot of problems. We see here with a gave up two outs to the field on the four seamer alone. He's dropped that usage all the way down to sub 19 percent now. Moving a, moving it over to the cutter and the slider, so it's kind of a hy hybrid pitch. Increased it to the cutter usage in particular. It's about three percent, and he's up to 45 percent on the slider. So um, throwing it heavily because it's really his best pitch, and it's been good for him. About uh, half an out in the in the positive to the field here so far. Um, the best change, however is the fact that he's reduced the four-seamer usage and he's getting value out of it. He is above average here at a full out to the field, and that allows him to to establish early in counts. Now, he still doesn't have, um, you know, he's thrown the sinker at, you know, double the usage here a little bit too. That hasn't been great for him just yet. And the sinker's not really a very good pitch. So... At 10%, he'll probably need to dial that down and move all of the fastball usage, or you know, a huge percentage of it, over to this cutter slider mix. Um, maybe add in a sweeper or something like that. That will make him fully serviceable if he can establish with fastball command, stop with the walks. He's still walking left-handers over here. He's great against righties in terms of control, but he's still walking lefties at a full 10% clip. Um, so he's having trouble getting ahead in counts a little bit still, but very, very encouraging for JoJo. He does have the whiff stuff if he can keep the, the slider and the curveball down in the strike zone as, he, as he's as he been doing. Curveball has been very equitable as well, about an out above average here too. Slider's been just, you know, like I said, uh, about a half an out. So still good here, and he's moving more usage over to the good pitches, which is what we want to see. 6,200, this is a, an okay price. And given that he is eking value out of the four-seamer here, I think that makes him playable. And this is a very dangerous spot. I am not going to go out of my way to target it. But it's an okay price tag at very low ownership against a team that's going to strike out a crap load. Now, this is a day game in San Francisco with a 15-mile-an-hour wind blowing out to dead center. you got to be very careful with this in heavy exposures. But I think this is a super shrewd tournament spot that you could play some JoJo Gray because the Giants over here, they're going to be probably the third most popular team on the day up there with the Yankees and the Dodgers. It probably warranted just because of their high upside in a day game with the wind blowing out. But... I mean, this is they're still going to strike out a lot, man. We and we've seen that when they can when they go cold, uh they can make a lot of soft contact and and pop some balls up in the air because they hit so many fly balls as it is. Now, they make a lot of hard in general against right-handers, right? 34%, that's the second highest number on the day. However, JoJo with this really really good slider curveball mix down in the strike zone induces north of 20% soft contact to both sides of the plate. Now, they're going to platoon very heavily here, and of course, his biggest aggregate problem has been to the left-handers, but these numbers are starting to tank now that he's got good four-seamer value and still plus value on the slider and plus value on the curveball. So this makes this gives him a full three pitch mix, you know, in the absence of the you know negative value in the sinker um and very little cutter usage over here. He, he's migrated he's not throwing the changeup anymore at all. So this makes him serviceable at, at sixty two hundred with a full three pitch mix against a team that will strike out and that will be popular in tournaments. However, you know, like I said, it's a very, very dangerous spot you will probably end up in this 15 to 16 point range or something like that. But don't be surprised if he pops for like 23 or, or something like that. Because he might get some run support here against Sean Mania. 5,900 on the mound for him. I'm not dealing with this. Um, now, he's made some sweeping changes, so to speak, in the arsenal. He's, he's migrated uh, most of the usage all the way over here to the four-seamer. He's, he's still throwing the sinker a little bit. Um... Actually, I take that back. He's, he's migrated all of the usage over to the four-seamer. He's not throwing the sinker at all anymore. 
literally 50% of the of his arsenal has has gone over to what has historically been a bad pitch. And over here it's it's still yielding the same out to the field, right? Um so there's no value on the fastball whatsoever. At least he's not throwing a, a two seamer anymore. That's a, you know, that's a good change. But it doesn't matter if the fastball or if the four seamer is still bad or when the four seamer is still bad, you still get to give up a lot of production. Now the change up over here, <clears throat> excuse me, over here he is still throwing at a full 25% clip has increased the slider usage as well up to a full 29% of the arsenal, right? So, um, four seamer slider change. That's going to keep him as a fly baller over here, uh, which is okay. I mean, not like we really want to target some, uh, fly ball hitters from the nationals or, or, or anything, maybe like a Joey Manessis or something like that. Um, Lane Thomas has been has been fine. Alex Call has been fine uh, against lefties this season. I think Stone Garrett's got a lot of pop. So you can get to some righties over here um, and and target the fly ball lean for a guy that's getting blasted in his fastball arsenal. Um, change up value also is about break even. Slider value has been dreadful. So he's nearly doubled the usage on the slider and he's nearly doubled the negative value that he's realizing uh, as he's actually nearly tripled it. So um, I'm not, I'm not dealing with John Benaya here at, at any ownership whatsoever. He will fully get the X and absolutely will get the X against uh, the nationals who don't strike out at all. 15% aggregate K rate and pushing 400 PAs. Now they're creating at a slightly above average clip here, despite only hitting for a 117 ISO and no hard contact. It's, it's because they don't strike out. They get on base, and they make things difficult. Um, I stayed off of Manaya in his last start because of I was worried about pitch count. And he went full five innings. But uh, I don't think he's going to make it that far today. Uh, and I'm not going near any ownership whatsoever, even at this price tag, even against a traditionally bad team. I don't like the pitch mix here. Um, I like the, the change from the sinker to the four-seamer, but there's no value on any of the pitches. Um... And so I'm not I'm not dealing with the Manaya stuff at all. Give me some of the Nationals. I think this is another cheap and off the board stack that you can get to. Um, they they've been popping literally for the last like two and a half weeks in value scores because every damn one of them is cheap. So you can play all of these guys and you'll get a little bit of leverage on the field because some people are going to play Manaya and I really don't think they should be. Okay, Toronto and Philly, Gosman on the mound. We talked about him a little bit earlier. This is another one of the guys above 10K I'd like to get to. 11-1. He got picked apart pretty good by Boston in his last start. Gave up eight earned or something and really sprayed it. Um, I love playing Gosman in particular after performances like that when he just gets blown apart because this splitter is so good and it's still plus value for him. And I really like playing him for a bounce. He throws a lot of strikes. He doesn't walk people. So when he's bad, it's just because of contact and he, and he floats everything. So um, not spotting the fastball and, and things like that. He's just on the negative side of the variance. And he's expensive, don't get me wrong. And I don't like going after Philly in general, because it, especially now that they have Harper back. But they're probably going to be missing Schwarber today. He fouled the ball off his foot last night. Um, so they'll probably give him a day off here in the day game. So they're going to be missing him, which is good for our prospects if we want to play Gosman. 11-1 is stiff, but we've already talked about several teams that are cheap that we could get to that are in some pretty equitable spots, I think, um, that can make this happen. You could even squeeze out some, like a, I don't know, something crazy, like a Nats in the Rockies or something, uh, and play both Kershaw and, and Kevin Gosman if you want. Uh, probably not something we want to go out of our way to do, but... Um, you know, that, that sort of construction is viable. Uh, you can also play some Zach Wheeler on the other side, 10-7. Now, I'm probably going to leave him on the shelf in, in my shorter entry stuff. Uh, in deep tournaments, I like getting exposure to Wheeler literally every single day uh, when he's on the slate. And at lower ownership, he's going to get totally forgotten about, as is Gosman up here at, at 9%. Um, that's why I'd prefer to get to Gosman because he's, he's less popular. Uh, but Wheeler is fine, too, and I think the matchup here is a little bit more difficult for Wheeler in particular than for God. But don't get me wrong, like, this is a bad spot for both of these starting pitchers, and they're both expensive. So if you want to fade both of them and, and just go to, like, uh, you know, Kershaw and uh, who else we have that 
uh, what Castillo. I mean, that that's a fine approach if you just want to uh, not even deal with it. Um, but I think this is a fine tournament play. He's popping in projection pretty much as Wheeler always does. But this is a bad spot. 22% K, 21% K rate uh, for Toronto against righties this season. Buck 12 WRC plus. Create a little bit. Not hitting for as much power as you'd really expect, but a lot of hard contact here still. And we're still kind of seeing a little bit of Zach Wheeler early season variance. He said two of his last three starts were very good against the Rockies and Houston, but he got torn apart a little bit in that same start. This is the same matchup um, as uh, as Gosman had. He he got beat up a little bit by Boston. Um, it went five innings, struck out just five, and gave up four runs. So a little bit of variance still here in the early going with Wheeler. He's He'll figure it out. He'll be fine. Nothing is wrong in the arsenal or anything like that. Um, you know, but this is a bad spot. You know, fundamentally. So it is for both of these guys. Don't get me wrong. But I, I would like to get to a little bit of Gosman here at the very low ownership. Less enthused, of course, about 17, 20% ownership on Zach Wheeler. Um, you know, so I'd, I'd much rather just find the extra 400. It, we could do that today, and that's not a problem. But I think uh, getting to offense here, I'm not really thrilled about. I don't want to go after either of these arms necessarily. But if you want to play the Phillies, uh, target Gosman again, yeah, you play Harper. Sure, go ahead. Um, you play Brandon Marsh. He's down to 4,300 now. That's fine. Play Castellanos, 47. Probably not today. Not super thrilled about Trey at 56 in this particular spot or Bryson Stott leading off at 45. So I'm not jacked about it. I'd rather just play like a one-off or two, uh, really from either side. But, I mean, everybody on Toronto is super expensive too. Um, everybody that you want to play, that is. Maybe like a Danny Jansen at 3,600, one-off catcher piece. I mean, okay, but um, not super jacked about getting to offense here in this game mostly just pitching okay houston and the angels uh christian javier i think you could consider playing some javier here as well at very low ownership um now everything is is usually fine here and, and it, javier is very difficult to stack against in general because he's got such a heavy fly ball rate and a very high strikeout rate uh it doesn't give up a lot of power necessarily he does get on the barrel a little bit to right-handers uh, traditionally, that's the four-seamer slider. Makes he'll float the slider a little bit sometimes. Um, and when he's kind of on the downside of the of the four-seamer variance, it's not yielding all that much plus value for him. He can, you know, kind of miss the edges a little bit, get over the middle of the plate some, and and get onto the barrel. Uh, and that's really only been his only susceptibility uh, in terms of contact, now he has trouble throwing strike one, st strike one, and getting ahead in counts. That's what increases the variance with Javier. But he's got such a high strikeout rate and pretty good stuff that uh, he can really get himself out of a lot of uh, problems. He's got a, some good chase north of 30% and a t CSW pushing 28%. This is all fine, and really hasn't changed much in the arsenal. Throwing a little bit more of the slider. Uh, it's up to 31% or whatever. A little bit more of the curveball, up to 11 12% or whatever, at the expense of the four-seamer. Um, but the value is basically the same. You know, he's, he's only eking about half an out above average on the four-seamer now compared to the one-plus in the aggregate sample here. So that's coming down a little bit, but the slider's still good. Um, Change-up that he throws very rarely, he's actually getting a lot of value out of, so that's encouraging. Um, still only throwing it about 2% of the time, though, so, you know, n nothing to really speak of there. But good slider value still at, at an out above average, and, and the curveball is still just kind of, meh, you know, giving up about a half of an out to the field. So not a lot has changed here in the arsenal. Elevated price tag, yeah, at 98, but nobody's going to be playing him. This makes him an excellent tournament play, just like we saw last night with Fran Valdez. Some of these guys here that have strikeout stuff, and no ownership, they have a lot of upside in tournaments, and Framber popped for like a 37 last night or something. So uh, this makes him very playable, uh, even against the Angels, in a day game in L.A., which I generally don't want to do. Uh, there's a little bit of a wind blowing out. Um, so we could see some offense here, because there's going to be a lot of fly balls and some hard contact still. So if you want to go after some hard contact and fly balls... With some righties of the Angels, sure, you can play some Taylor Ward or, or Trout. Uh, you got to pay for these guys. Um, Anthony Rendon is okay at 3,700. He'll hit some fly balls as well. But like I said, I generally don't like stacking against heavy fly ball pitchers like this. Super hard to get there. 
in general. Uh, and with opposite-handed hitters like Christian Javier, he induces a, a boatload of soft contact here, pushing 22%. So not my favorite playing Shohei at 6,400 in this particular spot. So I'd rather just play Javier at very low ownership. Griffin Canning on the mound, we're not going to be doing this. 6,400, we targeted him with the Cardinals in his last start. And that worked out uh, eh, fine, I guess. Um, you know, he he went five innings, just struck out three, but did give up, give up five runs. So he's still a little susceptible here. Uh, bad four-seamer. And the slider has actually been an equitable pitch for him in the past. Uh, not so much in the early going here this year. I mean, these these are the, uh, the aggregate figures. Um for him because he's just got the four starts this season. So uh, the changeup has been great, but this is a huge, huge delta between four-seamer value and changeup value. Uh, this is going to, th this gap is going to close. You're, you're not going to be able to eke out this much value out of a changeup when it's only a four-mile-an-hour velo delta to a really bad four-seamer here. So uh, this is going to, this gap is going to shrink and it's going to do it quickly. Um so I'd much rather get to Houston over here. I don't really care about good change of value that he's yielded so far because I'm looking for a regression in those uh, it, in this gap here. Uh, you can't give up this much on a four seamer and have this much good value on a change up when there's they're really not that different a pitch. Um, so I want to get to Houston here and they're gonna pop pretty good, I think. And in value scores, they're actually coming in as the second best team so far however they're coming in at probably 10th in ownership or something like that um very very low in ownership so i think there's a lot of value going after griffin canning here uh and targeting maybe some correlated teams with some javier i don't want to pay 4800 for jeremy pena that stinks but um yeah, it's okay it's like whatever in stacks alex bregman i would like to play at 45 jordan of course 62 it's fine uh josie abreu he's got like a 500 520 OPS or something. He's just been awful. Uh, Kyle Tucker, he's 3,700 though, is Josie. You could play him. Kyle Tucker at 54. This is fine as well. Getting a little bit health, healthier with Chaz. Probably not going to activate Michael Brantley this series. Um, something fishy going on over there. So I'm not sure what that is. But uh, same sort of guys down here. You could play Corey Jolks, David Hensley, whoever. Probably stay off of Martin Maldonado, even though he hit a bomb last night. Um, very playable stack here with uh, with Houston targeting Griffin Canning. I'd like to get to them uh, a pretty good bit, I think. Uh, okay, that's it for the breakdown. Um, let's quickly go over stacks here and and get out of here. Uh, Oakland and the Yankees, definitely just the Yankees. Uh, not just the Yankees. You can play some Oakland here, target Johnny Brito uh, as well. Colorado and Pittsburgh, you can play Colorado. Um, I'm probably off of Pittsburgh here. I don't like stacking against Sensatella outside of Coors Field usually. Um, but he still gives up a lot of contact. It's the ground ball rate that really makes it difficult. Um, probably land on a little bit of Rich Hill, maybe, but I don't think I'm going to get to a full 20% of the field here. I'd rather get to some hedge stacks of the Rockies on the other side. Offense really starting to heat up for them. Playable price tags now. Uh, Detroit and Cleveland, I don't want to go after Eddie with Cleveland because Cleveland stinks. Uh, and I don't know, if you could, if you land on some, some bat and field, I think it's probably okay at 6,100. Probably not going to go out of my way to play Eddie either at 9,100 uh, against Cleveland. Looking for a little bit of regression in Eddie's performance, but undeniable that uh, he's been fantastic. So probably just kind of a mid game here for me. Um, Dodgers and Milwaukee. Dodgers going to be popular. Uh, I'd really like to get to Kershaw. He'll be popular as well. Um, Milwaukee's just been horrible. Uh, so no, no offense there for me. Um, and probably kind of off the Dodgers offense a little bit, maybe some Miggy Vargas or something like that. You can always play Mookie and Freddie or whatever, but, um, eh, kind of off of full stacks, not super thrilled about attacking Wade Miley. Generally Texas and Seattle, uh, Dane Dunning made some positive changes, of course, which might neutralize a little bit of the upside for Seattle. You can play them, however, cause they're at very playable price tags. Um, but they've been dreadful against the one pitch that Dunning is going to throw a lot in this matchup. So um, I'd probably side with him. He's at a playable price tag if you land on that at, what, 5,800 down here. Not super thrilled about it because he generally doesn't have a lot of strikeout stuff, but it's okay. Um, Texas, probably not. You could They're just expensive and hard to get to. Castillo's fine. 
Miami and Arizona, um, almost exclusively just the D-backs here. Uh, you can play Jazzy and Soler and, and Luis Arise, whatever. Uh, but I want to play Merrill Kelly at very low ownership again uh, against a pretty bad offense over here. Um, and the D-backs are going to be off the board because they're expensive and hard to get to. But Eddie Cabrera is going the wrong direction in the pitch mix here. Um Really not encouraging at all, so I want to target him. Washington, San Francisco. Give me Washington definitely against Sean Mania. He's made one good change, but he's not getting any value out of it yet. So uh, no thank you there, and definitely no exposure to him for me. JoJo at 6,200. I'd rather have exposure to him. Uh, probably not going to get super crazy. This is a very dangerous spot. They're going to platoon super heavily against him. And I'm not totally convinced that the change over to the – or from the – uh, four-seam fastball is really going to persist uh, given how bad it's been in the past. But you know, so you can get to some San Francisco stacks and play some of these guys over here, like a Jock, Conforto, who's cheap, etc. Um, but I think you can mix in some JoJo to your tournament pools pretty much every slate. Toronto and Philly, just, just pitching here for me, like Osman. Uh, I like Wheeler in general. I don't like the spot, though. Um, Houston and the Angels, give me mostly... Houston here and and some Christian Javier pieces uh but you could play I mean this is a day game in LA it's 75 degrees or whatever um you know you can play some of the Angels as well but I, I do like Houston uh okay so that's it uh keep an eye out for projection updates we'll have those pushed to the site for the next few hours before lock here and good luck to everybody on the main